kick off. Hello everyone, welcome to our Kenora webinar on assistive technology and the NDIS. My name is Yvette and I'm part of the team here at Kenora and I'm also joined by Erin, who you can't currently see, who is manning the chat. If you're a Kenora member, you may already know us as coaches from within the community. We're also excited to be joined today by Kerry Kingham and Catherine Fall from The Choose Shop. Kerry is the CEO and Catherine is the quality manager at Choose. They are our eyes and ears on the ground in terms of what the game changes and latest innovations are in assistive tech. And they are passionate about helping people gain independence and quality of life through knowing what their assistive technology options are and having an easy way to access them. Just before we get right into it, a brief background on Kenora if you're not already a member. Kenora is a safe and supportive online community where you're able to get support for your NDIS questions from us coaches and, and our community of thousands of other NDIS participants, their families and support coordinators. You can also find service providers on our marketplace who are experts in their field. Now, if you're already a Kenora member, you may be aware that we record these sessions. Uh, to share the replay of the webinar and any resources we talk about within the Kenora community. If you're not a member, don't worry, we will send this replay and the resources direct to your inbox. Now, if you look to the top of your screens, there is a chat button. Please click on that now. This is where you can introduce yourself, enter your comments, ask any questions as we go along. Erin will be monitoring the chat for questions when they come up. Uh, we'll most likely uh, leave the questions to the end of the presentation as we've got quite a bit to get through today. Alrighty. Before we jump into it though, I'd like to make an acknowledgement of country. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the country we are meeting on today, all across Australia, wherever you are as we broadcast this webinar across the nation. We recognise their continuing connection to the land and the waters and thank them for protecting the coastline and its ecosystems. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and those to come and to all First Nations people today. So if you're just joining us now, this webinar will take a tour of the realm of assistive technology in the context of the NDIS. But I want to start it with a big <laughs> disclaimer in that this webinar won't be able to tell you what assistive technology will help you in your specific circumstances. Now, we've all been very vocal in the preparation for this. We've all been very insistent on that. Sometimes there are no black and white answers about what will be funded and what won't, or even the exact process for accessing a specific AT, um, as each time what's needed comes down to you. Uh, the participant and your specific needs, your goals and your circumstances. But what we hope you get out of today is a spark of interest, some resources and the motivation to seek out assistive technology and to see what it can do for you to help create a sense of sustainable independence that might have otherwise been out of reach. So today's web webinar has been created in conjunction with our guests today, uh, The Chew Shop, and Choose is an assistive technology marketplace with built-in NDIS functionality that I'm sure Kerry and Catherine will talk about very shortly. Thank you both Kerry and Catherine for being here today. Um, can you please tell us about Choose, the Choose shop and both of your roles within, within Choose? Let me just share my screen. Here we go. Kerry. Please hi, take it away. hi, thank you. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. My name is Kerry Kingham. I'm the CEO at The Choose Shop. And first of all, thank you for having us here. We're really, really excited to be working with Kenora and their community. Choose came about because we saw there was a lot of problems around um, finding assistive technology, um, easily comparing prices, and being able to order it in a way that is easy for you and your plan. So what we've done is we've made the commitment to be the largest um, e-commerce marketplace that's geared towards the NDIS in Australia. Mm -hmm. We've currently got over 200 sellers on our platform and nearly 3,000 products already. And what we do is we just bring all the sellers and the products together. We're not here to tell you what to buy or, you know, what you need. What we've done is acknowledge there's been a huge problem in trying to find the right products 
compare them easily and then order them in a way that's easy for you on your plan. So we've come up with a way of bringing all the people together, having a huge range of assistive technology available, but doing it in a way that means you can easily claim. So if you're self-managed, you can easily go on there and purchase um, and have all the required documentation. If you're plan managed, you can actually order it and send it to your plan manager for approval and payment before you get your product. So you don't have to worry about paying for anything yourself and then getting reimbursed. And we give you one easy to read NDIS for any invoice. So everything's on that invoice. Even if you buy from 10 different sellers, you'll get one invoice with all the, the um, required data you need to claim. We know that you've got better things to do with your time than sit and cruise on 10 or 15 different websites. And we're really passionate about this and helping you to have more fun in your lives, achieve your goals, and just have a great shopping experience. So that's my role and our business. I'll hand over to Catherine. <laughs> Thanks, Kerry, and thanks, Yvette. Hi, everyone on the call. I'm Catherine. As Yvette said, I'm the quality manager at Choose. Quality is very important to us at Choose. We're not only guided by the NDIS practice standards, but we are continuously benchmarking our business against the NDIS quality indicators, ensuring that um, ongoing quality assurance is integral to um, our organisation and our activities. Um, we're committed to providing high quality services and products on our website in a responsive way, responsive to our customers, to our sellers and all of our other key stakeholders as well. Um, we operate through a, the implementation of a quality management system to ensure the highest quality of services and products and to support the rights of people with disability, including their choice and control over the purchase of and their access to quality products. So that's my role at Choose, and I'm hoping everyone on the call today leaves with a greater confidence in the purchasing of assistive tech through their NDIS plans, and hopefully with some thoughts about how the assistive tech risk framework could be best leveraged for positive participant outcomes. So thank you for having us. Back to you, Amazing. Rebecca. Amazing. Thank you, Kerry and Catherine. Well, let's just jump straight into, um, and obviously both of you can jump in at any point as well. Um, what exactly is assistive technology? Um, it's actually the collective term for equipment or devices that help you do things that you otherwise maybe couldn't due to disability. And we may actually have assistive technology as part of our everyday lives, but we've integrated it so well, we barely notice, which ultimately that's the goal of any new assistive technology that's being introduced to our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so yes, it, it's equipment or devices that help you do the things you otherwise couldn't. It may also help you do things more easily or more safely. And the ultimate goal is to increase independence. So just some uh, everyday examples of assistive technology, very low tech um, diaries, apps. I mean, Kerry and I have had a conversation about the Motion app, um, which is an adaptive uh, diary, um, which is an app on smartphones. Even things like shopping bag carriers, prams, and then some um, assistive tech that's more commonly recognised within the NDIS space are things like um, wheelchairs, walker frames, hoists, non-slip mats, orthotics, hearing aids. The list is potentially endless. Um, so the ultimate question is... Um, and the, the list is endless in terms of what assistive technology is out there. How do we find out what assistive technology could help us? And, and that is the $64 million question, essentially. Um, today, we hope to give you some starting points from where you can explore what AT could help you in your specific circumstances. So here we go. All right. So sometimes... Um, there is a clear need present and sometimes uh, we need to spend more time finding and filling the gaps. Um, so the point that is most useful to start from when considering assistive technology is your original NDIS plan goals. What have you identified as being most important to you? What would you like to be able to do in your daily life or otherwise? And what are the hurdles that are currently in your way? 
Firstly, when there is a clear need for assistive technology that is specific to a condition or disability, support and advice from advocacy and support organisations is a great place to start. More often than not, they are connected to industry-leading assistive tech specialists and can guide you through the process of setting you up with specific assistive technology. Sometimes the hurdles are with... Oh, sorry, I've lost my place. Sometimes the hurdles or the unmet needs are more subtle and we don't know how to fill these gaps ourselves. So without that knowledge of what the possible solutions could be, we need to explore the options available to us. And that requires further investigation with people who work with assistive technology specifically. Oh, let's not lose our place. All right, clear assistive technology needs. Um, if you have a clear need for assistive technology, it um, follow the process process we outline later in terms of if it's low, mid or high assistive, high cost assistive technology um, to utilise your current plan or incorporate into uh, a new funding NDIS plan. Um, obviously, as part of um, integrating any assistive technology in your daily life, um, working with your current supports in how to integrate um, the learning and the um, feedback to make sure that the assistive technology is helping you achieve your goals as outlined is a really, really big important part of the process, even when the assistive technology is helping you with a clear need. Um, it's also worth noting that when you may have some clearer needs when it comes to AT, um, make sure you take the time to explore more subtle gaps in support or function that AT could help you achieve. All right, so finding and filling the gaps with assistive technology when the, the need is not as clear. Um, <laughs> sorry, I keep losing my spot. Um, and I want to make sure I touch on all of these things. Um, to identify the more subtle areas of need that can be supported with assistive technology, we've got three approaches for you, obviously, on the screen. Get some advice, utilise the assistive technology resources that we'll be presenting to you today, and ultimately self-determination. So your experience living with disability and where you feel that assistive technology can help you achieve your NDIS goals. So... There may be some anxiety about accessing assistive technology in that people might have the idea that it requires formal and expensive reports from specialist assistive technology advisors that have waiting lists forever, because that is a lot of the feedback that we get within the community. There may be some anxiety about uh, the cost involved with gaining very specific reports, um, occupational therapy reports, that sort of thing. Um, it may be the case in some instances, but more often than not, the professionals that you're currently working with under your current plan supports are best placed to advise you on any assistive technology suggestions or refer you on to assistive technology specialists that can help you. So that's people like your current multidisciplinary team. So in allied health, um, your physios, your occupational therapists, audiologists, speech pathologists, um, and if you are actually working with any assistive technology advisors, they can obviously um, put their hand up and let you know how to go about um, finding the best AT for you. Um, your support workers, your friends and family um, may also have some insight as to what they feel assistive technology could, could help you with on a daily basis. Now, one of the big resources um, that we are sharing with everyone today um, is a, an incredible quiz that the Chew Shop um, and Kerry at the Chew Shop has put together. It's uh, an assistive technology quiz. Um, Kerry, are you able to take us through the quiz um, and what's actually involved in, sure. in this? Yeah, so, that would be great. So before I talk about any of this, I'm going to give you the standard disclaimer, okay? It's really <laughs> important that we don't know any of you personally. We're not professing to be AT, um, you know, technology specialists in the sense that we, we can't actually recommend specific AT for you and we're not one of your allied health professionals. So no matter 
what you do, what resources you access, make sure that you do it in conjunction with your support people, whether it be, you know, as um, Yvette was saying, you know, your existing allied health workers and OT, um, an AT specialist, et cetera, et cetera. They are best placed to actually help you determine what is right for you as far as specific AT goes. So what we're giving you is general info, but what I'm hoping to do show you that by using the quiz you can actually kind of narrow down some general advice and give you a starting point. So what we've done is put together this quiz which has 20 questions and it covers 10 different disability areas. So obviously there's some overlap you know between some of those areas so what we do is we ask you the 20 questions it's just a you either answer um this never happens to me it sometimes happens to me or always you know there's three different options so it's really simple to respond to. At the end of it you'll get a report that shows you how you scored in each area. So, you know, you'll either get sort of a most likely to be impacted by this, least likely or sometimes. As I said, it covers 10 different um, disability areas. So you get an initial report straight away when you do it on the screen and then you'll get emailed this booklet and it's a beast. It really is. It's almost as bad as an NDIS document. No, not really. <laughs> much, much easier to read, but it's got 44 pages in it. It gives you a summary of each of the disability area types, you know, what an overall sort of summary of that type of disability or impairment might look like. And then what it will do will give you a suggested list of AT that may help if you identify as having these types of challenges. And each of those um, links there is hyperlinked through to a particular product that falls under that type of much easier than NDIS documents. Thank you, Erin. That's lovely. Um, you'll actually be able to go in there and click on those links and it will take you to that particular product. So some of them are on the choose shop, obviously, yeah. because that's what we do. Other ones are from outside retailers as well. So we've tried to give you a really balanced sort of list of a starting point for AT that you could use. And all of this AT, generally speaking, will fit into your low cost AT budget. So it should be sort of down in the spot where you can just buy it without too many challenges on your plan. Um, so this is what we've done. Uh, we've had quite a few people take the quiz already, which is fantastic. Um, and as you take the quiz, you'll get another email from us. It'll send you a little um, free um, code to do some freight, free freight on the cheese shop if you want to go ahead and order some of our products. That's my only sales pitch. I want to <laughs> have yeah, to do we'll, it. We'll come, we'll come back to the, at the yeah. end as well, Karen. Uh, we'll make sure everyone's aware no, of that no, for sure. That's all right. But it's, <laughs> this, is, this is a great way for you to get a starting point, to get almost like a personalised shopping list yeah. that you can use. So yeah. Who doesn't like doing a quiz about themselves? Me, for sure. <laughs> I mean, I do like it. I do love it. Yes. You have done right. it. You did do it. Yeah. I did do it. And it was incredible. Yeah. I'm like, oh, my God, I didn't even think of that. That's It's a very helpful helpful resource. Great place to start for sure. Yeah. All right. So think that's one of the resources um, that we've got today. So that is incredible. And I believe Erin's just shared that link. So thank you so much. Um, everyone, have a, have a look at that. It's, yeah a great resource and a, a good starting point, especially yeah. for low cost assistive tech. Um, and I just wanted to touch on the final point, um, uh, self-determination. Um, one of the best ways of identifying areas where assistive technology can help you achieve your goals is having an honest conversation with yourself where you actually uh, acknowledge what is challenging in your life and what is currently limiting you and how your NDIS goals are affected by these limitations. Uh, this does go back to the very early days of applying for the NDIS funding and looking for the worst possible day as reference. Um, it is, again, potentially really hard to do, as I'm sure it's hard enough living with that the first time around or on a daily basis. But by re revisiting these situations after the fact, we can see if there are any gaps that be, can potentially be filled with assistive technology. It's here that lived experience comes into play and we're testing assistive technology products, especially if applying for mid or high cost assistive technology and providing written evidence on how it improves your independence and potentially reducing person-based supports. Uh, that information uh, submitted to the NDIA when applying for this assistive technology funding is extremely helpful. So your, your personal uh, account of uh, trialing or testing mid to high cost assistive technology is um, very key to demonstrating um, its effectiveness for sure. So why is AT included in the NDIS? 
Well, ultimately, for all of the reasons that we've touched on before, um, but ultimately, um, it, it's working towards increasing independence for you, the participant, and it's all about um, building the life that you want to live with less reliance on other supports. So while we are um, herd creatures and we definitely um, enjoy connection with the people all around us, but the more self-determined and the more independent you are, to live the the life that you choose, the better. So that is where assistive technology definitely um, bridges a few gaps or potentially can, we hope. So let's go into some more detail about how assistive technology is funded and not funded in the context of NDIS. So what's not funded? Um, we do get a few questions in the community about what's not funded. And here's a list of a few different scenarios um, where the NDIS will not fund uh, AT. Um, so anywhere that is funded, any devices or equipment that's funded by other government agencies, as in if you've been in the hospital system and then you have medical equipment as part of ongoing treatment or management, um, home equipment that everyone uses on a daily basis, things like kettles, um, irons or, you know, literally household expenses, they will not be covered. Um, video games is also another one that comes up a fair amount. Um, NDIS will definitely not um, come to the table in that regard. Um, items for treatment or rehab, um, those expenses may be covered in other areas of your budget, but not specifically to do with uh, AT. Um, changes to public spaces, um, things like footpaths, um, uh, communal areas will not be covered. Um, public vehicles like bus buses and taxis, um, assessment or therapy tools that are used by therapists in your um, on, in your uh, support team, uh, that will not be covered by funding either. Then we move into iPads and devices. <laughs> this is a really big one. And obviously um, we've been we've been through a time um, with COVID. Um, and COVID-19 definitely changed the way that some supports were delivered to participants and technology enabled support continuity through telehealth, video conferencing and other technologies. So it was incredible and obviously has opened up a whole lot of opportunities in terms of flexibility and for participants um, being able to access the capacity building funding to better achieve their goals. So that has been an incredible outcome. Um, the NDIS has recognised that um, and are continuing with the flexible approach to accessing low-cost assistive technology with a few more conditions. Um, specifically to do with um, smart devices and fitness equipment. Um, so obviously the budget for low-cost assistive technology is $1,500 and any purchases are ideally in consultation with your existing support providers. Um, specifically to do with iPads and technology, the NDIS outlines that participants should not spend more than $750 on electronic devices that are needed to maintain existing services. In particular, the use of low cost assistive technology funding for an iPad or device. It needs to maintain or improve delivery of funded NDIS supports, like a program, therapy or requirement. So physiotherapy services or Auslan interpreting provided via video conferencing. It must be confirmed by your support provider in writing. So an email is sufficient as needed to continue receiving supports and services while maintaining physical distancing or other health requirements that are specific to your circumstances. Uh, it is the simplest solution or device required to maintain funded supports. It is not the same or similar to a device that you already have or could easily have access to. So as in your household doesn't already have an iPad or similar uh, item. Uh, it's not something that another organisation could or would provide you and is not specifically excluded by NDIS rules, as in it, the NDIS just outright will not supply it to you. So 
Participants are advised that if a standard tablet, computer or iPad is required to participate in online classes, they should generally cost no more than $600 and a suitable protective case or bag, usually costing less than $100, should also be purchased to protect your investment from damage. So we've had quite a lot of um, questions in the community about um, protective cases um, and how they had been told that they wouldn't be funded because they're considered accessories. It's very much, excuse me, um, NDIS definitely appreciates that protecting your investment from accidental damage to ensure that you actually use your device is fundamental to its purchase. So these are the more specific terms that the NDIS has outlined in regards to low cost assistive technology budgets when purchasing iPads and computers. Um, there are also other specific technology exclusions I just want to briefly touch on. Um, we've had a few questions within the community um, within Kenora that people have asked about um, things like internet connection being covered. Um, the NDIS will not fund uh, internet connection, mobile, um, mobile enabled devices, multiple devices that do the same thing um, or any accessories outside of um, very simple protective um, cases. And that is um, due to those items being considered ordinary household expenses, then being outside the scope of being disability specific uh, expenses, and there may be alternative solutions available to participants. So that, that's the reasoning behind those exclusions. Alrighty, so here we go into the three categories that assistive technology is broken into based on the total investment amount. And then these investment amounts then inform how participants access that level of assistive technology. The NDIA advise that it's best to buy some items and then for other items it might be more cost effective to rent or borrow them especially if your needs are likely to change and so obviously the NDIA has different processes for accessing accessing low mid and high cost AT and this is where we have our uh, risk uh, expert Catherine understanding risk for assistive technology this is a very brief outline, but we will move. All of this will also be available. The slide deck will be available for everyone after the fact for you to go through all of this information at your own pace as well. So please don't feel that you need to keep up at this particular time. We're just talking to these particular topics as we go through. So Catherine, did you want to have a, a walk through what the, the cost risk matrix is here? Sure. Thank you, Yvette. Um, so when thinking about assistive tech and your NDIS plan, it's important to think about two factors. So not only cost, but risk as well. These two parameters will determine what you can claim and how you may be able to claim those as assistive, assistive tech items within your plan. So the risk level relates to whether or not an item is likely to cause harm, mm. whether the item requires professional advice or assistance to set up and use, and whether it is therefore safe and effective for use. For example, high risk items could be those regulated by the TGA, um, therape the Therapeutic Goods Administration, or require training for use, or they may require specific selection, adjustment, or customization in order to prevent harm or to reduce the risk of harm, mm -hmm. and to ultimately maximize the outcomes for the participant. Um, as such, high-risk items will require written advice from an assistive tech advisor, as Yvette's previously touched on. Mm. And depending on which cost category those items fall into, they may also require either a cost estimate or for high-risk, um, high-cost, they'll require a quote in order to be claimed on the NDIS under the NDIS plan. So as could be assumed, the higher the cost of an item, the increased likelihood of product complexity, so too with the risk level, hence mm. the NDIS requirements for additional information from an AT advisor. While this 
initially may seem like an additional barrier, it's actually a safeguard to ensure the participant is accessing the right tech to suit their needs and to meet their goals with their safety as a priority. Um, the low cost, low risk assistive tech includes items under $1,500 and they usually fall within the core budget being either consumables or other low cost assistive tech. And you can purchase these items without advice or approval and without needing a cost estimate or a quote. Assistive tech falling within this category is fairly standard equipment that can be purchased off the shelf, doesn't require any instruction or customization in order for the participant to use them properly and safely. On the other end of the scale, the high cost, high risk assistive tech, this includes items over $15,000 and these usually fall within the capital budget. A key point to note here though is that in this case, risk doesn't always relate to participant safety. So a high cost, high risk item may include, for example, a complex communication device that may be perfectly safe to use, but without the necessary training, as specified by an AT advisor or another allied health professional that you have a close relationship with and knows you well, the participant may not get the most out of this device mm. and therefore it puts their goals at risk of remaining unmet. So if we think about risk levels as a participant safeguard rather than a barrier, mm. guiding us in the direction of the best possible outcomes in the yeah. choice of the most appropriate and effective assistive technology. So I hope that helps to break down the framework a little more for everybody on the call. And yeah, don't see it as a barrier, see it as a safeguard and work with your AT advisor. And well, um, and this matrix is, is incredible to kind of see how the NDIA views assistive technology in terms of investment and risk. Um, individual participants don't necessarily need to know exactly where the specific AT require that you require sits, but it helps inform you as to what the best approach towards accessing it is, because ultimately mm -hmm. um, it, it will help you prepare for um, your application to be successfully funded. So yeah, I think thank preparation you, is key, yes. uh, Yvette, good point. Yes, yeah. yep, amazing. All right, cool. So expanding on what Catherine has just spoken about in terms of accessing each low, mid and high cost assistive technology, um, it all starts with a conversation. And to be fair, even with low cost assistive tech um, and your, your core consumables budget, there is plenty of low cost AT that you can access without having a conversation. Um, I'd still 100% advise to have a chat with your plan manager with um, your allied health professionals that you're currently working with, even um, your support coordinator, your friends and family, to um, make sure that any purchases that you are thinking of making are the best, will give you the best outcome for, for using that budget that you have. Um, specifically about accessing um, assistive technology in your your plan. Um, you can speak about it in your initial or your next plan meeting, or if you already have a plan, you may be able to use the existing funding that you currently have in your plan, or you can ask for a plan reassessment. Um, to have assistive technology added to your plan, it must pass all reasonable and necessary criteria, and the NDIA must understand why you need the assistive technology and how it will help you pursue your goals. In the case of accessing mid and high cost assistive tech and some low cost but high risk assistive tech, you'll need to get, as Catherine said, the independent advice of an AT advisor, which, and these people could already be part of your support team. Um, but just to give you a list, um, and this will be available as part of the slides as well, so any allied health, audiologist, occupational therapist, orthoptist, orthotist, prosthetist, physiotherapists, podiatrists, and speech pathologists. There are specific assistive technology mentors with specialist qualifications in assistive tech. There are orientation and mobility specialists for the vision sector, continence nurses, and also rehabilitation engineers. Uh, always get the advice of your plan manager, your LAC or support coordinator to ensure that you're getting the right evidence to support your assistive technology requests. 
Turnaround times for NDIA decisions on assistive technology is 28 days for low and mid cost assistive tech and 50 days for high cost assistive tech. Now, I just wanted to briefly touch on co-contributing towards assistive technology purchases. Um, you can actually use your own money or funding from other sources to buy additional features or access additional services, which may not fall under the reasonable and necessary uh, guidelines that the NDIA um, have for assistive tech. You're the one that's going to be using this assistive tech on a daily basis. So if there are some customizations, if there are some decorations, or if there are any things that kind of fall outside of the the very basic and simple funded um, AT that the NDIS will fund for you. Um, that is where you can step in and 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 um, bridge the gap in funding. Um, one of the yeah, custom upholstery for wheelchair. There was one example of someone having um, their sports team's um, fabric on their their wheelchair. So that kind of thing. Like if it if it helps you enjoy your AT if it helps it integrate into your life more easily if it, it helps you enjoy um, having that as part of your your day-to-day -day life that is definitely a consideration um, for you in this situation all right the reasonable and necessary assistive technology worksheet now this has been circulating around um, the Kenora community for the past couple of weeks and really this is um, the reasonable and necessary um, guidelines that the NDIS um, has for supports in general, but it's tailored specifically to do with assistive technology. So it's really a great checklist to start with um, when you're thinking of uh, accessing assistive technology. Um, excuse me. It's just a good reminder to go through uh, does this item directly relate to my disability? Is it not an everyday item that is considered a household expense? Will this help me meet my goals? Will it increase my independence and participation? Is it value for money? Is it likely to be effective and beneficial? Is it safe and reliable? And do I have the budget for it currently? Or am I able to um, access that budget? Uh, it's a helpful snapshot of the evidence and the thought that goes into a successful assistive technology purchase via the NDIS. Alrighty. So specifically accessing low-cost assistive tech, the budget bucket is core consumables, um, as was in the um, cost-risk matrix that Catherine shared before. Um, you can advise your LAC at a planning meeting of any specific low-cost assistive tech that you might need. Some might require specialist specialist advice mostly to do with risk um, and Erin if you can just drop the price guide and the access um, protocol from the NDIS that is um, a download from the NDIS in regards to what they consider reasonable price framework for a lot of common um, low-cost assistive tech that is currently um, utilized within NDIS um, plans. Accessing low-cost AT more than likely just requires a conversation with your plan manager to confirm the process for purchase. And also, if you are interested in purchasing any low-cost AT via Choose, um, it's making sure that um, your plan manager can um, understand, well, I'm sure they'll be able to understand the invoice that comes from Choose, but um, just letting them know that that is the process by which you'll be accessing it. Or if you're self-managed, you speak to your LAC or your uh, plan manager, to, I mean, your NDIA planner to confirm your eligibility. So accessing mid-cost assistive tech. As uh, the risk cost matrix outlined, the budget bucket is capital. Uh, it requires evidence to access. Uh, that evidence can be in the form of a letter, an email, or a report from an AT advisor. You need to let uh, the NDIA know what you specifically what you need, why it's the best value over other supports, how it will help you with your achieve your goals, and an estimate of cost. Doesn't need to be a formal report, but it does need to be in writing uh, for their um, for their reference. Uh, this is also um, the the area where your lived experience, as in trials and um, testing, comes into play. Um, that 
creates a, a very um, strong base of evidence for the purchase or the funding um, for the mid-cost assistive tech. Accessing high-cost assistive tech obviously comes from capital again, requires the same evidence base as mid-cost AT, but it may have an added level of complexity um, and an individual assessment from an AT advisor, as Catherine had outlined. More than likely requires specialist knowledge to implement and or training for you, the participant, to be able to use the technology to its optimal levels. Um, it will always require a, a quote for funding, so you'll need to um, go through uh, the planning process um, with um, the quote being approved by the NDIS. Maintenance and replacement costs, especially when it comes to mid and high cost um, assistive technology, um, funding for repairs and maintenance will be incorporated into your plan. So if it's small repairs, it'll be part of your core consumables budget. If it's major repairs or ongoing maintenance to ensure that the assistive tech functions at its optimal capacity, that will be part of your, um, your plan funds um, over the course of your plan. Um, it is important to note that if your item isn't of acceptable quality, if it's not fit for purpose or it doesn't work properly when it's first delivered to you, um, you need to contact your um, assistive technology supplier to let them know that and let them fix that problem for you because um, all assistive tech will have a warranty that covers those issues. Uh, if the problem can't quickly be fixed, you'll be able to get a, a refund or a replacement for that specific um, technology. All righty, so Kerry, we've got a couple of um, case studies that we can walk through um, and you can talk to these particular circumstances with some assistive technology that has been identified can fit into these scenarios. Did you want to um, go through this? Sure. Where are you? I can't see you. <laughs> there you are. I'm here. I'm here. Amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is where um, the first one is Adam, as you would have seen. He's four yes. and he's um, autistic and he has some goals. And this comes back to what Yvette was talking about, where before you go and purchase any AT or even consider any AT, make sure that you're clear about what you're trying to achieve. So look at where you are now and where you want to get to, and then what's the gap and what do you need to help you close that gap? So for Adam, and these are really broad ones I know, but I've mm. tried to pick something that is, you know, it's just, <laughs> fairly general, but just to give you an example. So Adam um, wants to be able to join the local kindergarten and play in groups with other children. He wants to develop some strategies to manage his emotions more effectively. And as a family, they want to go on holiday before he starts school. So these are, you know, really achievable and realistic goals that probably most children in this sort of situation or with this, um, these areas to work on would. So something that um, Adam's parent or um, support person or carer has gone through and had a look and done the quiz and sort of got some general outcomes around um, supporting sensory um, processing challenges so if we go through to I think it's page 27 this is the, the quiz report that you get so this is the full quiz and it shows or as I said all the different um areas but if we go through to page 27 this is actually around um sensory challenges so I think it might be after this one so and this is the um the pages to, to explain it but the one I really want to look at is the one where it goes through to um, some potential um, AT options. So as you can see, we've got a list of the different things that, that might help Adam. So if we look at it and go, okay, he wants to learn to manage his emotions more effectively. So one of the things that he might didn't do, get that. Could you try again? That was Siri oh. talking to me. She just can't mind her own. She cannot mind her own business. Seriously, <laughs> everywhere with me. That is the downside of using an app, a, a Mac. <laughs> um, so if we click on, say, the second link there, um, Yvonne, where it says the weighted blankets or lap pads, can you go to that link there? Yep. Thank you. So it didn't show on my screen. So this is an example of AT, a low cost AT. Okay. So it's taking you through to the product on the Choose Shop. And these are some things that he could use to 
um, you know, put on his lap to sort of help weight him down, make him feel more comfortable, help him self-soothe. There's um, animal lap bags as well. And, you know, this could actually be used when he's at kindy as well. So it could be something that he could use at kindergarten if he finds that he's having some overload. We've also got things like um, the uh, sensory slime or putty. So this is something that he could actually use to perhaps self-soothe and to distract him and work on some other sensory um, areas also. So this just gives you an idea of the type of things you'll get off the quiz. So that's that's one case study there. Mm -hmm. The other one we have, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is around mobility. Um, so physical impairment, fine gross motor skills, um, so Cass's goals are to be able to independently shower, complete daily tasks like shopping, doing laundry, hanging it out, bringing it in, being able to easily reach items in the storage at home, because this will give her more independence and will help her to improve her quality of life um, and all aspects of her living. So if we go to, I think it's page 15 in the yeah. quiz for this one. So... I know, we're just mobility. playing music. This is where it'd be good to have Siri playing us some music in the background. Yep, so this is the mobility section. Mm -hmm. And we can see the list of um, suggested low-cost AT here includes a reacher grabber tool, which actually works towards one of Cass's goals, which is being able to reach things herself. So if you that first link there, so we've actually got, you know, the, um, the reacher, the helping hand tool there, and we've got a variety of those. So you can see how you by tying your AT back to your goal, um, it can actually help you um, improve obviously your life, achieve your goals. We've got get jar openers, we've got um, adaptive garden tools, um, you know, bathing and showering aids. So, you know, there's all sorts of things there which would actually help Cass achieve her goals, but are also in the late low AT. So she can purchase those and work towards her goals without too many challenges at all because they all fit in that low cost AT range. Did you want to add anything to that, Catherine? Is that correct that, you know, all of that fits into the low-cost AT? She can buy it without any concerns around yeah. the risks or challenges there. Yeah, I, I I do agree entirely. There's one point that I would add to the whole conversation about assistive yeah. tech, and that would be that any assistive tech solution and the supporting um, evidence from an AT advisor should be holistic, um, meaning it can't be broken down into different parts. Yeah. So, for example, if it was a complex communication device and a charging um, uh, a charging power pack, they can't be claimed separately because one cannot function without the other. So they yeah. would come under the same claim. But, um, yeah, that was just one point that I wasn't sure had been raised yet that I wanted to add. Yeah, amazing. Huh. Thank you. Yeah, and again, all of this, as I said, is very general. It obviously needs to be, you know, read and reviewed in conjunction with your own requirements and with your healthcare professionals. 100% for sure. Amazing. Um, Erin, we've reached the end of um, pre the prepared webinar. Um, were there any questions that came up during... Yes, yes, yeah, so we've got a few questions. Cool. So I'll just kind of go back to the start and go through them. We don't have heaps mm -hmm. of time, but hopefully That's we'll fine. be able to get through them. Mm -hmm. um, so firstly, back when we were talking about um, that you were going through the types of low cost assistive technology and what might be reasonable reasonable and necessary, you mentioned yes. something about everyday items wouldn't be covered. Mm -hmm. Tracy's just popped in that tipping kettles could be covered. So I thought it might be good just to quickly touch on yes. um, when something is an everyday item and when it's mm -hmm. not. Just kind of yes. go over that quickly. Sure. So um, a tipping kettle specifically, as long as you can relate that back to um, your disability um, requ um, requiring that adaptive technology, assistive technology, um, and then how that will then increase your independence, then definitely, 100%. It's just the basic form of kettle um, is something that is part of a household purchase, uh, as long as it can be directly related back to your disability, 100% A-OK, -okay, for sure. Yep, fantastic. Always needs to come back to that need, doesn't yes, it? Yes, that yep. need, for sure. Uh, when you were talking about the tech with the um, internet connections and stuff like that, we had mm -hmm. a question come through about full detection devices. Now, mm -hmm. I know that they can be covered, but sometimes there's ones that have SIM cards in them, so mm. they can connect. 
does anyone want to <laughs> try and answer this question? Because I'm not 100% sure. I know sometimes there can be issues with those sort of ongoing charges with things like that, but I'm not sure about the SIM card one specifically. Is that something that we might need to look up or does anyone want to? I would definitely that? say that's something that we would have to have a look into specifically. Um, I'm sure that... Um, that, that sort of technology is changing on almost a daily basis in terms mm. of um, like satellite um, positioning. Um, I mean, I have a, a, a running tracking watch which doesn't require a SIM card, but it can geolocate me in my, and I have a safety alert on it. So I think in those sorts of circumstances, there potentially could be other alternatives that mm. can still fill the need that don't have those um, specific technology requirements and then that will greater better fit the NGIS requirements for that particular assistive technology so yeah, yeah that's a great idea looking what else is out there mm -hmm. Fantastic. And I would say that's where working with a specialist AT mm -hmm. um you know with an AT specialist because they're going to be aware of the rules and the changes so I think yeah that's a really good advice yeah yeah, fantastic. Um, Andrew put a note in here, something about adding a goal to your risk matrix, Catherine, if that would make sense. So I think what I took from that was that it might be important to look at, you know, whether or not something meets your goals or not. How does that fall into that risk matrix, Catherine? Does that sort of come under that or is that looked at a bit separately to what you were showing? That's a really good question. And I saw that one pop up in the chat and I thought, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, mm. So I'd be very keen to explore that a little bit further off the top of my head. I probably can't answer that or how that would look. But absolutely going back to a goal and I, I did sort of touch on goals as in with the high risk, high costs, the risk is not always a safety or mm. um, an injury risk per se, but it could be a risk of a goal not being met. So I think there's definitely scope for a further conversation and some further thoughts about that. So thank you. Was it Andrew? Thank you for that question. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll look into that. Cheers. Um, we had a question about whether or not it's considered double dipping if a participant wants a second opinion regarding the written advice. So if they're going to a different OT mm. regarding mm. some mid or high cost AT. Mm. How does the That's NGIS That's a really good that? question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I, thought, um, I guess it would come down to what the reason yeah. is, but has, yep. does anyone have any experience in that? There no, is a lot of a tricky one. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's lots of material on the fact that there is um, budget allocated to receive um, advice, um, even on low cost um, assistive technology. Um, so there is budget allocated for advice before actual purchase is made um i would say that if that budget was exhausted and you did need to get second opinions that would have to you would need to go through um your usual routes to have your plan modified and i think that would or not plan modified but um, that's a really good question. Mm. I'm going to I think, I, I if, if they've got that, additional funding there that that yeah. you're not using for a different purpose, like that's not allocated for something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it definitely worth having okay. a conversation with yeah. plan manager, your your um uh, NGIA planner. Um, if you do have yeah, if you have funding that's available, it mm. seems like best use of that funds to make sure that you're getting the most optimal assistive technology outcome in the end because ultimately that's in everyone's best interests for sure yeah I, I think, think optimal is the best word there sorry you yeah question. no that's okay I was just going to say that I think ideally we take a step back and we look at formulating a really strong ongoing professional relationship with somebody who is considered an AT mm -hmm. advisor mm -hmm. so that you can trust that mm -hmm. their advice is in your best interest and if you can formulate that ongoing relationship and um yeah, it, it, that shouldn't be a problem. But of course, mm. there are going to be situations where that may be, be an issue. But if if you can look at it from the perspective of an ongoing relationship, that's mm. key. Yes. So, yeah. Mm. 100%. Yeah. yeah, fantastic point there, Catherine. Absolutely. Um, now, uh, Louise asked if you can partially fund a better version of something, for example, a tablet with more features. Um, than what's reasonable and necessary now that you did go through that a bit that you can mm -hmm. sort of pay that extra I'm mm -hmm. just going to add on to Louise's question and ask how do people actually go about doing that if someone was to buy something from Choose say that mm -hmm. was you know 
just um, more features than what they actually need that the NDS would cover, what would be the best way for them to actually go about making that purchase and paying that section themselves? Yep. Um, what we would recommend is that they actually email our customer success team and point out the product that they want to buy and the, you know, perhaps improvements that they want to add on to it. And then we would connect them with the seller, but we can still facilitate you know, the, the documentation for them, the claiming from their plan manager, but we would, you know, we'd work with them in the seller to actually get all that paperwork together for them. So we would split the purchase where they would fund and pay some of it themselves. And then the rest of it, we would send off to their plan manager to claim for them. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. And, and I suppose if they're purchasing from somewhere else, if they had the funds to, not everybody does, obviously, but they could pay it outright themselves and then just claim part of it yeah. back from their plan manager, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Then they would just need to submit that themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Either way, we'd work. We'd work with them to sort it. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and a question about the removal of assistive technology. If anyone knows if this is covered, such as custom-made ramps in a house, the removal of those. I suppose when you're moving house or something like that, and repairs to damage caused during the installation as well. Would that kind of thing be covered by the NDIS? I don't know. <laughs> well, that's, well, that's a good question because you know Very it may question, come it? it may come under maintenance. It may not. Yeah. I think it would be. I think it would be best to um, inquire and get written yeah. confirmation or approval That'd before be doing a, a anything. That would be a capital question yeah. for sure. Yeah. So that would yeah. require a lot of conversations. I would imagine for sure. Yeah. 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 Very case yeah. by case, I suppose. Yeah. That Hundred percent. Yeah. Isn't it? yeah. <laughs> Um, we had Glennis point out that NDS doesn't usually cover weighted blankets. Now, mm -hmm. I've just put my answer to that in the chat, but I'll, mm -hmm. I'll open it up to you guys as well. Um, obviously, what you showed in the image was more like the pillows, the weighted pillows, rather than a blanket. Now, those can generally be covered, can't they? Mm -hmm. Yes, and we've got unweighted um, toys, um, really, really popular, weighted soft toys that um, there's a sloth, which has been extremely popular. Mm. So Not that I think is an, an alternative because it's, you know, you can cuddle it and it cuddles you at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. No, and it doesn't a, have that good, sort of safety risk that um, yeah, a blanket yeah. might. It doesn't yes. come under potentially restrictive practices or, mm. you know, covering themselves completely or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but then. you're you're it's it's a good point to make, Erin. Um, sensory items. Um, it's definitely an area that, um, is a little bit grey at the moment in terms of um NDIS funding. Um, uh, and what is considered um easily accessible, low cost AT. Um, I would say in in those cases. It's a great idea to have a conversation with your plan manager in regards to purchasing sensory items. More often than not, if you're working with an occupational therapist or someone similar, then a, a very strong case can be made for their purchase. Uh, it's just making sure that um, in the very rare case of an audit that you've got the paper trail to, to say that it is very specific to needs um, and that um, you have the advice to say that that is the best purchase for the current situation. So, yeah. Mm, yes. Um, now, we just have one more question pop up from Andrew, who was talking about the goals in the risk matrix before. Um, he said, do we see capacity building value to participants to add a risk matrix overview into the choose resources and shopping cart to enable their AT product selection? That would be an incredible, <laughs> incredible thing. Answer, yeah. <laughs> talk, talk about what's coming, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Andrew. And I love that you're really engaged with this because it's yeah. something we're really excited about too. Um, what we're building in the back end of choose for um, the future is each product will have a suggested uh, risk category assigned to it because there is always some flexibility particularly in the core budget around what people claim under under which um, support item reference numbers etc but we plan on having yeah as I said every item on the choose shop will have at least a recommended risk rating so that you can if it comes up as a high cost high risk you can have those conversations earlier on without yeah. the disappointment of having your claim rejected so mm -hmm. absolutely uh, watch this space Andrew yes <laughs> adapting as needs change for yes. sure amazing yes. <laughs> Catherine is deep Catherine is deep in that at the moment yeah, yeah. <laughs> Was well, there anything the else? We've came amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you so much, everyone. We've made it to the end of the webinar.
we really hope that you now have a little greater understanding of how assistive technology can be uh, accessed through the NDIS system and um, ultimately it comes down to better supporting participant goals. The conversation doesn't need to end here today. Join us in Kenora. It's free to join if you're not already a member. Jump in and ask any questions uh, that we didn't get to today or let us know if it sparked any ideas for you. Uh, the Choose team um, have uh, a user profile within Kenora, so I'm sure they'll jump in to answer any uh, assistive technology questions that may pop up from the community. Um, we'll be sending an email out to you all and anyone that registered for the webinar with a link to the video later this week. And of course, we'll post the video and the resources that we've mentioned uh, into Kenora. Um, thank you, Kerry and Catherine, for joining us today and, and for sharing your knowledge with us all. We greatly appreciate it. Um, I'm Yvette. That was Erin in the chat. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And we hope to see you in Kenora soon. Have a great day.